So really an authenticity about my own history too. We encourage nudity. <laughs> the greatest value proposition that you have in the club from a business and marketing standpoint is your originality, right? So, so yeah, thank you for coming on. I appreciate your time. Absolutely. I'm so, I'm so happy to be here. I'm yeah. so honored. No, I, I know. So you've got Butter and Filth as your business. And, and when we connected a, a few weeks ago, I know you're doing quite well. So maybe just give us a quick overview of, of the business and, and maybe even, you know, touch on kind of how things have been going during Rona as that's, you know, very relevant for, for a lot of us. Yeah. Okay. So Butter and Filth is this project that kind of took over my life. We can talk about how it started and its origins a little later if you want, but we'll talk about what it is right now. What it is, what it exists as today is to the naked eye, it looks like a pole dance studio. I don't run it like a traditional pole dance studio. I don't use the word fitness. I don't do any of that. What I'm more interested in is how pole dance can be used to return home to your own feminine erotic, whatever that means for you. So that's what it looks like, you know, to the naked eye. It's, it's like, oh, it's like what I do after work. But, but what I really want to be doing is giving people the space to, to create the best versions of themselves that, that they can be. We are, oh my God, the coronavirus. Okay. Later we'll talk about how, how Butter and Felt started because it's a crazy story, but coronavirus shut us down for three months in 2020. And ever since we reopened back in June, you know, to in-person, we have been capped at 50% capacity due to uh, state mandates for social distancing, masking and all that stuff. So we were at, we're, we're at 50% capacity, but listen, while we were closed for three months and we've been at 50% cap for, for the other six, we only had three months of 2020 that we were able to operate as, as full normal, we'll say normal. We finished off the year 38% higher revenue than we did in 2019. Say what? Yeah. So, okay. So, so we, like, 38% higher increase in revenue, half the capacity for nine months of the year. And closed. So, okay. So 38% growth in revenue closed for three months, half capacity for six. So nine months of the year, we were either closed or at half capacity. We only had three normal months in 2020 and we grew 38%. That's insane. Like, it's, yeah. That oh my god okay so I mean what do you think that like what what was going on there I mean how did how did you make that happen so here's what I did right and and I I also I I mean I I'm an artist I think like I have a really strong vision uh, myself but like one of the things I've always struggled with is like like wielding that vision with precision because I have so many ideas right like and I'm like which one do I pick. And so right as coronavirus happened, I, I got my, my second business coach ever. So I had my first business coach for the first year I was open and I had recently become a client of, of this other woman. And, and what happened was, you know, she, she's an aggressive woman and I really respond to that, right? I really respond to people who are like, they mean what they say. We're both eights. I don't know if you follow the Enneagram at all. Like, I don't know if that's like a thing you do. I love it. But like, we're both eights. So we both have this like fiery personality that, and, and, and I really respond to it. And what she said was, cause I was like, what do I do? What do I do? What do I do? So we're kind of scrambling. And she was like, focus and double down on your mission and vision. That's it. Like she was like, actually do less, not more. Right. And so, so hone in on your values, hone in on your mission, decide what you serve, who you serve and eliminate everything except that one thing that you do. And that's one of the things that sort of starts shifting my vision from, from like believing myself that like, I am like just a pole studio. And I say that being critical of like the dismissive qualities of those terms, right? Like just a pole studio. And I was like, oh no, 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 no. Like, like I am, I am like this 
place that provides this, you know, like, and, and, and so I doubled down on, on who I was, who I wanted to be and what I offered. We, we did, I, I hate the word pivot, but we pivoted. I have a pretty big international following. It's not big. It's actually very small in, in like Instagram follower language. It's actually very small, but, but I did arrive at Butter and Filth through like three U S tours. So we, you know, we've got a pretty big national following. We have a couple of people that are international. So when we pivoted to online that kept us afloat, that kept us afloat. And I really started pushing my retail sales. And, and then when we came back in June, we reopened on June 17th, I think I reopened to like six week wait list because what we were preaching, like during these closures, people really connected with, because I think during the, during like the thick of the coronavirus, like national closures, I think what happened was people had a lot of time for introspection. And I believe that what I offer which is this like returning home through the feminine erotic. I think people needed 10 times more. That's amazing. That's, I mean, and I love just how, how you said that of going back to your mission and who you are. And if you ever needed any direct proof or anyone that's like, well, that sounds dumb. How's that going to change my ROI? It's like, well, you, the proof is in the pudding and being closed for three months, then six months at half capacity you did 38% over last year's revenue where you did pretty damn well from, from what I know. And 2019 was a totally normal year for businesses. So I think we could, we, let's keep that maybe as like an open loop that we can come back to and maybe dive into that. But maybe I think that could be a good segue to like, yeah, what, like, I want to know that crazy origin story of, of butter and filth, how you got there. Cause you even said it, you're like, yeah, it's kind of a crazy story. And I'm like, that's what I want to hear. <laughs> all right, so, all right. So here's, so here's the lowdown. So, so I, and, and this actually feeds so much into what I'm saying about like returning to your story, your values, your mission, because for me, my business is so heavily informed, like by my own personal life. So here it is. So I grew up in a working class family in the 757, the Tidewater area. And my parents were these hardworking, uneducated, poor people who did, who did everything they could to get by. They had, they had their list of like struggles and barriers and whatnot that, that, that it's, it's a cycle of poverty, right? It's a cycle of poverty. You have to keep you, it keeps you down. So I went off to college. I wanted to be an artist ever since the day I was born. There was this like drawing that my mom kept where it's like, what do you want to be when you grow up? Like in kindergarten, I said, I wanted to be an artist. So here I am. I'm an artist. But in getting there, you know, I decided I was going to be the first person in my family to go to college. My father didn't even graduate high school. And, and I, I thought to myself, I said, I'm going to, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to art school. I'm going to go to art school. And one of the most amazing things about being from a poor family is that like, like no one cares what you do as long as you get by, <laughs> right? So, so I, I had a lot of support in this like art school thing, took out a shit ton of loans, got to school at 17. I was a freshman and my father was sick. He had cancer, which if he eventually died from just a few months into my freshman year of college. And I didn't know what to do for money. So I was like, well, obviously stripping is the first thing like that I thought of and I thought of it because I saw pretty woman when I was a kid <laughs> and Julia Roberts got everything she wanted like she she painted she had pizza these dresses so I was like oh yeah I want that too and I told my mom that I said what does she do and my mom said you know when I'm a little kid she was like she's a prostitute and I was like well I definitely want to do that and she was <sighs> like huh you know <laughs> and mm -hmm. so so, so I arrived, you know, at, at dancing in strip clubs in 2002, three weeks before my 18th birthday and, and, and did that completely behind closed doors and in, in the closet for 10 years. Right. So no one knew because back then, like the P you, you can't, you, you couldn't tell people that it's not like it is today. Yeah. yeah. So I danced and then I went to grad school twice. I got two master's degrees, kept dancing, decided through my own shame of, of like, not, not about stripping, the shame of like where I come from, the shame of poverty, the shame of lack, that what I was going to do was change who I was by pursuing a full-time career in academia, right? 
so I was like, I'm going to be a university professor. That's what I'm going to do because that will mean that I'm not who I am, which is this like poor girl from Hampton, Virginia with, you know, this like story of, you know, a, an impoverished family and food stamps and all of that stuff. I didn't want that. And I didn't want that to be who I was. So I was like, I'm going to be a full-time academic. This is, this is what I'm going to do. So that didn't work for numerous reasons, right? For numerous reasons. One of them being that I am, I struggle taking direction. I, 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 I began teaching at a university. I still do to this day, but, but that tenure track shit didn't work for me because I didn't want to capitulate to, you know, someone else validating my research. I was like, no, fuck y'all. And also I'll be damned if I'm going to like submit like a 10 inch binder of research to make 75 grand a year. Yeah. I was like, no, I can't do this. So I kept after grad school while I was teaching, I, I, I was dancing literally in the classroom during the day at the club at night that fizzles out because, and I'll get, I'll get to butter and filth. I mean, I promise that fizzled out because, because you get old, you get old. It, it like it, my hips were breaking my knee. I could, didn't want to stay up at night. It was making me like, not the type of person that I wanted to be my creativity. My juices weren't flowing. Like I wasn't getting what I wanted out of like my art because I was just so goddamn tired, but I learned so much. I learned about sales. I think strippers are the the best navigators of of the soft sale ever, right? Like okay. I I'm a captain of uh-huh. that fucking ship, right? <laughs> so so I leave that career behind as dance pole dance studios were starting to rise in popularity, and I worked at several, worked at several, got fired from them except one all but one. I feel like that goes back to your not taking direction part, I which I bad. 100% resonate with. I am a bad employee. I'm uh-huh. a bad employee, but I'm a great entrepreneur. So this one summer, myself and my, my friend who, you know, we would pole dance together. I said, I said, listen here, let's, let's, let's do a tour together. Let's tour the United States over the summer, this will just be, this will just get me like a little bit of money over the summer when I wasn't working for the university. Cause I, you know, I'm not like, I'm off, off technically for those three months so we can tour. And what we'll do homie is cause uh, she was, she was a stripper too. And I said, what we'll do is we will bring this like stripper flavor to these pole studios that that are, in my opinion, were kind of dry, right? Like I was like, oh, fitness? Like, what? Like nothing wrong with that. No hate, no hate, but that's just not what I do, <laughs> right? And so I was like, let's, let's, let's go on tour. Let's blow their minds. That's how Butter and Phil started. It started as a three-month summer tour. And summer tour to going to these Studio. dance studios. Okay. And we were like, y'all want the real shit? It's right here. Okay. Okay. Like I want, I'm a, so I'm a, here's what I'm imagining. And, yeah. and cause I want to clarify this part of the story. I'm imagining you and your friend rolling up into one of those. Maybe you've signed up for a class, maybe not, but you're, but instead of being like, Oh, Hey, we're here to learn. You're like, we're here to show you how it's done. Yes. So I, I want to know, like, give me an example. What that, what that looked like when you oh. went into one of these places. Oh, it was so well received. So, so it was so well received. We, people were hungry for it. It was exotic dance was, this was 20, hold on. This was 2017. Yeah. So pole dance studios prior had been zones of, of like fitness and, and you know, there was some sexy going on. There was some sexy going on, but, but they, that wasn't, that wasn't big, but it was rising. It was rising this thing about like strippers, strippers, like people whispering this was just coming up, right? It was just starting to bubble up. And by 2017, I had been in the pole industry already for seven years. And so what I did was I literally cold contacted starting, starting small, you know, in a 50, hundred mile radius and, you know, building from there, I just cold contacted people. I, I, I put together like a menu of offerings, headshots, pricing, 
bios and all this stuff. And I, and I just cold contacted all these studios. And I was like, y'all don't realize that this is really what you want, which is actually how I got my job in academia. There was no call. I, I emailed this university and I said, you need me. And it worked. So, and I think that that's that brazen confidence that can sometimes come across as arrogance, right? But I believe so much in, in everything that I do that, that I was like, you guys need, you need this. Here's this PDF. Here's these offerings. You can choose. Here's 10 workshops. I don't want to be your normal teacher. I just want to come in for two hours. Two hours is all I need. Here's 10 workshops. Pick two that you want, right? So she would do one. I would do one. And everybody said yes. Really? So you're Every- like, you just, you went in pitching them on, here's what I do. You need this. They all said yes. And so the, the, the United, or I guess it was all U.S. tour. It was all U.S. We did all U.S. Yeah. Cool. yeah next time, international tour. So then you did that, you did that tour. So you would go to each these spots Do you know, you, you'd have your two, two classes and, and that was it. And so, I mean, Leave. Yeah. How long did you stay at each one? So we would do probably like a day at each one. So like I would do one, then she would do one. So she would get two hours, two and a half hours. Then I would get two hours, two and a half hours. So their clients were coming in for like a five hour long experience as it were, and getting, you know, two different thematic, you know, explorations. And, and then we would dip and go to the next place. So we would do, we would be like in you know, Fredericksburg on a Saturday and DC on a Sunday, and then you drive back. And then the next week we would be in, I don't know, like Charlottesville. And then we'd go out to the Western part of Virginia or something like that. So we would just structure like these tours in that manner. And dude, people, I think there was only a handful of, because we did, we did that tour three times. We did it we did three different ones starting in very close in Virginia. It was called the sweet Virginia tour. And then we did Southern comfort and then, you know, started expanding the furthest we went was Boston. And I think we didn't sell out twice (laughs) ever because people were hungry for that shit. Right. Everybody gets, so they're there, you know, studios were marketing this to their, to their regular members and clients as we were just guest instructors just for the day. And people are hungry for it because every, you know, why do you pole dance? Think about it. Okay. If you really wanted to get a hard workout, you just go to the gym and lift, but you don't, you pole dance. So you can't tell me that people aren't there. There's not something else to this. You you know, I will never believe that ever. Like why go to, go to the goals, go to goals. Or yeah. And then do CrossFit, lift a lot and run a lot. And I think, and I love this train of thought, but, but I want to just clarify what was different about your offerings? And I mean, you're touching on it with, you know, fitness, but yours is just markedly different. So how did you sell this? And what was that difference maker between yeah. your classes and the existing more traditional ones? The market. Okay. So I think there was a few things. One is, is marketing that like, I, I am a lifelong stripper. You will get the real deal from me 100%. That's number one. Two. So it's so really an authenticity about my own history. Two. We encourage nudity. <laughs> we encourage nudity. Okay. And and it, and it's like, you know, cl- doors are closed. There's no camera. You know what I'm saying? Like we we created a space where the folks who took these workshops with us were were able to be brave you know, and whatever that meant for them. Okay. And, and also we did not in pole dance world, I think not always, but oftentimes in the industry, there's a heavy emphasis on choreography, right? So you go to your class and you ushers play and it's five, six, seven, eight, and you do this move, this move, and this move. And then that equals sexy. Right. And so what, what, what I was doing was flipping that on its head. I taught no choreography. It was all, it was all like concept prompting that there was no wrong way with the targeted end goal of what you come out of this with is your own style, not the style of the instructor that, you know, you're learning from, which, which like, again, there's nothing wrong with, but what's valued, the greatest value proposition that you have in the club 
from a business and marketing standpoint is your originality, right? Because if you're working a night in a club with 300 other women, how are you going to stand out? Right. And that's what I was pushing. So, so we're not going to turn on Usher and do five, six, seven, eight, though. That's really fun too. What we're going to do is turn on whatever, you know, music like that I played. And, and what you're going to do is through, through like my prompting, talk about let or let your body, you let your own body talk about what comes out of it naturally, right? To really, really delve in and deep dive into the individual and unique sexuality and desire of every single person uniquely. Damn, that is deep. And that's like, I mean, my mind is blown because I think, I mean, the whole, God, I can't even articulate everything you were saying about that originality piece and standing out and then just finding that kind of deep, I guess, expression of identity is just immensely powerful. Because something I was thinking earlier when you were like, you had that brazen confidence, like, hey, here's what you need. Here's my list, take it. And they all said, yes. You reached out to a university, very different, you know, entity, and they can be very stuck up. Hey, here's here's what I need. Here's what I'm going to offer or teach. And, and in my mind, I'm like, well, you know, how do you get how do you get that? And, and I was thinking, I was like, I wonder if this is what Nia teaches is like, well, yeah. sure, Nia can do it. She's just very confident. She just has it. I don't. And through your structures of classes, it's a vehicle to, hey, you want to get confident like, like me? Yeah. Here's how we're doing it. I'm going to encourage nudity. I'm going to encourage your full self-expression. It's not going to be chore- choreographed. Because in a way, like, I mean, there's that expression like dance, like no one's watching because it makes people I feel, feel safe. Like but, watching. but yeah, I think, and I think you said that to me before, like, because I, I know, like, dude, if I'm dancing, like, if I'm, if I'm doing karaoke, like, if, if there's something about, like, taking that, all that conceptual stuff of everyday stuff, maybe it's, you know, having to assert yourself in, in a job interview or even at, in the workplace, and whether it's, you know, dancing at a wedding or in a, you know, I guess you could say controlled environment, you know, behind closed doors, which, which you guys do, if you can do it there and build that confidence there, then you can take it out uh, into yeah. the world. It's like a microcosm for building that confidence Absolutely. in a super fast. So, 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 and maybe, and this, and, and I would love for you to expand on it of what you're really offering and what your mission is and all that. It's, I think it ties in with, you're not focused on the fitness aspect. If you can do the stuff, you're going to get fit. Sure. But what people are really buying and correct me if I'm wrong is you're going to, you're going to, express yourself in a way you never have and get confidence that you never thought you had. Absolutely. And, and what I say that I offer is, is like, I would call myself, so I would call myself like a passion alchemist, right? Because here's the thing. And, and people are like, why pole dance? Why aren't you like a, like a life coach? Right. One, because I'm an artist and, and I'm a creative and I want to make shapes with my body and I want, and I want sounds, you know? So, so it's always going to be through the vehicle of creativity, which drives my entire life and will till the day I die. Right. But I believe that when we're contending and dealing with, you know, exotic dance or pole dance, which is really just sexuality, sexuality is, is linked very directly, obviously, to desire, right? And so desire is saying, I want that. That's something I want, right? That's, that's what desire means. If we were to explain like the, the definition of that word, desire is to want. And here's the thing about wanting is that in order to want, you have to believe that you're worthy of receiving, right? Yeah. And so... So what I teach is, is I teach people, I give people the time and space to explore what it means to receive, to receive pleasure, to receive being adored, right? By other clients in the room to, to receive like, like space for contending with their body and their issues, right? Age, ability, size, you know, all of these. And, and I arrived at that through the club, which is why like my entire business is so heavily inspired by, by, by my experience at the club, at the club, you, you, you're told no, 90% of the time, 90% of the time when you, when you bust a sale on someone, they're going to say no to you. 
right? And they say no to you while you're like naked and like, you know, like, and, and like on a stage and, and, and like, you're like, do you, do you want me? Do you want this? And they're like, uh, uh-uh, I like blondes or whatever. And so, uh-huh. so like, like rejection is, was so bred into my own process. So it becomes very easy. It became very easy for me to be like, Hey, university, do you want me? Hey, all these polls to use on Twitter, do you want me? And, and I just couldn't believe they said yes. So like, like, I mean, I see why I offer something awesome. I have a great unique perspective and, and all of, all of that. Like I tell all my clients, I say, all I want is for you to get orgasms and raises. <laughs> that's what, it, you know, that's what I want. I want, I want like sexual and, and financial sovereignty, <laughs> right? Because, because it's a great you, line, you know, because if you get, if you can get the most intimate and vulnerable parts of yourself, your body, your desire, your sexuality, like all of this stuff. If you can find stable ground in what you want with that, everything else comes to you, right? And that doesn't mean everyone will want you, you know, like people that don't want me, you know, like people are, I I hate pole dance. I don't want that, you know, (laughs) like, There's tons, but, but when you can check in and be firm in your sexual or erotic self, you can, the world is yours. Do you think that's because you have fully accepted like the fullest acceptance of yourself that if you are denied or told no, then it's like, that doesn't affect me. I still have me. You know, I, I still have me. Yeah. I think. I mean, this is something I've grappled with for a while. I mean, I had a kind of like a personal development breakthrough, let's say almost two years ago. Mm -hmm. And so now for me, I'm like, have just like this deep, like slow burning confidence. And I get, and I get insecure still, just like anyone, I get sad, whatever. But it's like, if someone says, nah, Paul, like, you know, you're not what we're looking for, let's say on the business front or, or kind of rejected that way. I'm like, all right, well, that's, you know, that's a your, you thing, not a me thing. And, and it's like, we're just not a good fit, but At it's not- space for who does. Yeah, exactly. And so I'm not thinking like, well, maybe do, maybe I just suck. Maybe, you know, my skills are bad. And that was what was once going through my mind for a lot Absolutely. of my life. And, you know, I think, you know, there's always like challenges to go through. There's a lot of ways to get to that point. For some people, it's like, I traveled the world and I came back you know, a different person, but we, we, you really came back as the same person, but so much more comfortable in it. it it's, it's what everything you were saying is like insanely deep and power, like, and, and stuff that I, I believe on. I think that's why we connect so well, but it's just like, dude, if you could, if, if everyone gets that, if everyone can get that deep sense of self and confidence and what I love what you said, like, you know, desire is wanting something and then, and then in feeling worthy that you, you feeling worthy that, that you can receive it. Cause I mean, I know, I, I don't even know what the word for it is, but like, and you could just say maybe it's frustration. Oh, I want, I really want that. I have a strong desire for that position, for that person as a partner, for literally anything, but I, I'm not good enough. And I think that's, it's easy to say that with, you know, me as a guy and like dudes I've known growing up and, and been friends with like, oh man, look at her. Nah, she's, you know, she's not out of my league. league. I don't, you know, and, and, and that's just one example, but it's like, imagine being like, no, cool. I, I, and I don't know. It could take everywhere else. I'm starting to like ramble because again, you've like, you've got me shook. It's awesome. But I think, yeah. There is no league. The league is the, 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 we create the league, right? Like that's mm-hmm. in your head. So, so like now that doesn't mean from a business standpoint, hold on. So from a business standpoint, you know, we create our own limitations, as entrepreneurs, right? Or, and, and that, you know, like stains and moves into, into our, into our personal lives and stuff like that. I don't, I don't believe anything is out of anybody's league. I feel like once you have that solid grounding and sense of self, which, which is nobody's perfect on, I wake up and I have some days where I'm like, what in the hell, you know, there's no arrival. It's, it's, there's no arrival at that. Like, and I tell my clients that all the time. I'm like, you're not going to get there. It's a practice. Right. And, and once you, once you establish that practice, like I always say, like, 
practice doesn't make perfect. Practice makes permanent. Whoa. So, so you, so anything that you have a practice of perfect is, is like the, the, the best way in the world to hate yourself, right? That like that term or uh -huh. that striving, you know, like, 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 do you want to hate yourself? Okay. Try to be perfect. Try that, you know, because that like, that's the quickest path to hell is, 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 is striving for perfection, which I struggle with because I am a perfectionist, right? I'm recovering, but, but I've tried to reframe that in my own mindset, my own business. And the way that I service my clients is that, is that practice makes permanent. So if you, if you do yoga every day, then you will do yoga every day. That'll become a permanent thing, a fixture. If you drink 20 beers and eat a pizza and McDonald's like every single day, that will become permanent. Mm -hmm. And then the effects of the things that we, that become permanent can become containers that we limit ourselves with. Oh, I can't do that because I, I don't know. I'm not good enough because I eat blah, 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 blah. Yeah. You know? I think what, what's, what I love about that is the practice makes permanent is because the mind fuck is thinking that you've arrived because sometimes when you get to an awesome place, you're like, yes, I made it. And where I'm at is so much better. And then maybe you get, I always think of like, you know, someone's chipping away at your armor and may, and whatever that is, you know, maybe it's just circumstances of life, jobs, whatever. And you're like, Ooh, now I'm not feeling as confident. Maybe that was just a one-time thing. Yeah. You know, I, now I'm going to go back to it, but what I've come to find is that you're always in a, you're always, I, I instead of practice based permit for me, it's like, I got to replenish my mindset. I've got to replenish who I am because yeah, I had like a major breakthrough where I just felt amazing. And I'm like, well, I do want to keep this going. So what, what, what kind of led to that breakthrough was I was taking about an hour every morning just for myself. I'd walk around you know, my neighborhood, I would journal a little bit, I would, you know, do a little bit of meditation. And for me, meditation is just like sitting in silence for 10, 15 minutes, mm -hmm. but I, I still kept doing those things. And, and I think for me, that's my replenishment. That's my practice to, and, 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 you know, those are all vehicles, but I think it's, it's having a healthy amount of selfishness. And maybe that's what self-esteem is. I'm going to focus 100% on myself so that I can 100% be myself and, and take serve. that to others, other people. And that's what butter and filth does. It's that, it's that hour, you know, it's that one hour a week that, that people choose to give themselves. Yeah. You know, that, that where, where like, I'm like, I don't, I know you got to pay your taxes. Like, I know your kids are, you know, all the way over there and, and they're wiling out and you know, all this, but, but, but come into this body for like a second, for like an hour and just see what it does. And I think the body is such a unique, it's such an interesting tool to, to do this work in and, and sexuality and all this, because, because you're going to fail so often, right? Like you're not like, you're going to, you might fall off your shoe or, you know, today that, that trick sequence that we're doing might not be for you. And so you become really, really accustomed to, to, to not, I, I think failure is, I love failure. Like, like, I love it. Like it's the key to success, right? Like, so you're like, you're like, oh yeah, I'm going to do that. And then, and then you can't, or you, you fall out or, or you break your shoe or like, or like whatever. And, and then what happens in that process of, of, of practicing it because pole is hard. It's hard. Strippers are my people. Like they're like, it's hard is, is like, how do you, okay, I turn the lights on, the stripper lights, these like low lights are, you know, colored and beautiful. And then the music up is really, really high. And you've got these shoes on, which are an apparatus in and of itself. And, you know, just, I spent 45 minutes going over this movement phrase or sequence that your job is to now take from that, interpret it however your body does, but everybody's watching. So how do you do move with grace? And I'm not talking about physical grace, like looking like a ribbon in a wind. I'm talking about grace in your soul. Like how, like, how do you move with grace for yourself when you don't quite know what you're doing? You think you might suck at it. You don't know what's next and you might trip and fall down. That's a metaphor for life. hundred percent. Right. And, and that's what butter and filth provides 
daily over and over and over as as a as a practice in in not only grace to yourself but also you know my values which are uniqueness possibility and growth right i don't want you to look like anyone else that's uniqueness possibility is like do you can you imagine you walked in the door thinking you couldn't do this and you did like what does that mean what does that mean for your life and growth you know which is like look look back like look back at where you started and where you're at now, not just physically with your skill set, but, but emotionally, mentally. Can you ask your partner after coming to these classes? Can you ask your partner? Like, 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 I don't know, like, like move, move your mouth to the left. <laughs> <Go back. laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. Just to using that to, to take charge you want, like maybe you're, you're seeing things in different ways of, Right. Yeah. The, the stuff that you've been doing, I, I got a better way. Let's try this out. And yeah. it might like, and I, I know what it's like to, to ask for something. I, I'm a pretty non-confrontational person. I still am. Cause, and sometimes like expressing myself freely in, in many circumstances, I feel it in my gut. It is like some, something inside of me is pulling me back. And anytime that I've gotten past that, good things have happened yes so it's it's it, what sucks is that knowing like okay how to interpret that gut feeling is it just a change in yourself but it's going to take you to something positive or is it the gut feeling of oh no this is like you shouldn't do this and it sucks but i think i, I getting that intuition comes from being more connected to yourself and being in situations where you know, I, I think we all have this like comparison thing or like, if I'm going to do something, I got to be good at it, especially people watching. Yeah. And dancing is like, when you're on full display and you're moving, it's very, it's insanely vulnerable. Yes. Like, dude, I mean, it could be, you could say like, that's getting in front of people and dancing might be more, a more vulnerable position than having sex with someone being naked, which is because it's just yeah. one person. I mean, right. Cause you can always turn the lights off and get yeah. up to the earth with that. Like when you're half naked in front of like 12 other people, that's real. And then you're trying to describe with your body what, what sexy means to you. And we're not trained to do that. I think, especially women, mm -hmm. you know, like it's like, no sexy is something that is done for someone else, you know, not you. And, and, and I really want to kind of like break that. I'm like, what do you want? Like, you yeah. know, well, and, and even like, oh, well, that's for, you know, the woman on TV, that's for the woman who's the model, Instagram on a cover of a magazine, but maybe that comes back to what you're saying, well, I'm not worthy of it. And your, right. your whole mission is like, yes, you are. Yes, you are. That's amazing. I mean, that's, that's such an amazing mission to have. And, 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 and like the best gift that you can give to somebody, I think. Yeah. I'd, I would take that, that level of confidence and in myself over literally everything. Yeah. It's the best. It's, and, and it's, yeah, it's, I, I mean, I'm, I'm like living the dream. Right. So, so like who, who else on earth? I mean, besides maybe other, my, the people in my coaching group who are fucking amazing, but like I get to make money by and, and serve in this way that positions other people to get what they want. Like, that's what I get to do. Like, I just get to put people in and, and being in that like controlled space, the doors are closed. This is, there's no windows, you know, this is, this is for you. This is, this is your hour and this is judgment free and you can, you know, try out whatever, you know, whatever, what, whatever feels right for you today is like one of the, one of like, it, I mean, that's, this is the greatest honor, like of my life, like to be able to lead this and and it was, it's very similar to a strip club because when you would go, when I would sell rooms and in Virginia, the Virginia, there's a lot of room clubs. It's not a lot of stage club, you know, not a lot of stage money. And so the majority of my sales were not for lap dances or table dances. They were for rooms because that's where you would make the most money. And it was, and what I always loved about champagne rooms, VIP was the, the privacy of shameless desire, right? That, that, you know, you would, you would do your like value propositions to, to this client, to this customer of the strip club. 
well, you, you pre-qualify them for the sale first, always. And you do that with the watch, right? So, uh, okay. <laughs> so you look at the watch, right? And so you can pre-qualify someone, you know, because they got needs, I got needs too, right? And I need money. So, you know, you pre-qualify. I like doing it with the watch. And, you know, you sit next to them, you uh, have, do whatever you need to do to close the sale. Once you get back there, I would be, I was having all these like incredible experiences. Some were awful, but some were like, I got this guy once and he was like, yeah, yeah, our room, you know, that's a thousand dollars. And I get back there and he would, this one guy, he would pull out this like nail polish and he would be like, can you paint my toenails? And I was like, yes, right? Like I was like, of course I can paint your toenails. Like you're gonna pay a thousand dollars to paint your toenails. And here's what this taught me. Number one, this taught me that when given like a space, when you, when you create and carve out a space for yourself that you can be anything, anything can happen, right? Like, like you wanted that time and that space to do this thing that you desire. So that's like the light side. The dark side was, I said, I, I thought I was like, oh my God. Why can't you ask your wife? Dude, I see a ring, dude. Like, like, so there's this, like, there's desire that, that they felt unworthy of expressing to their partner. Cause I'm like, why? So you're going to pay, you're going to pay somebody a thousand dollars to do this thing. Why? And the reason why is because you don't feel like you can do it. Like outside of this, like controlled environment of the club. Mm -hmm. So that's the dark. And I thought to myself, I'm like, how, how, because I love, I love the darkness. I love shadow work. I love all that. And I'm like, how can I make, how can I make people's deepest needs and desires and, and possibilities? How can I bring that like into light mm -hmm. shamelessly? And it seems like, and we don't need to touch on like too many of them. You're like, well, there was a lot of good stories and some bad ones. Like, my, my imagination is that if those desires get, aren't expressed in a healthy, positive way, if they have too much feelings of unworthiness, it can make, you can manifest itself into un something unhealthy, unproductive, maybe even, you know, dangerous, right? I think of it as like holding a beach ball underwater, right? Uh-huh. So like you blow up a beach ball and you're in the pool and you're holding it underwater. Well, that shit wants to pop up. Like it uh -huh. wants to surface. And when you're holding that beach ball underwater, you get tired, right? You get your arms get tired, you get fatigued, you can't go play with your friends because you're holding this beach ball underwater. And that motherfucker, you will get tired and it will pop up. And like it will, and have you ever watched a ball like pop up from underwater? Oh, I used to do that in the pool all the time. Still about, do when I get a get a beach you ball. Know what I'm saying? And, and that shit could pop up and hit you in the face, or it could hit your friend and hurt someone, right? So, so let's take these beach balls, like Butter and Filth wants to take the beach ball and, and, and give it space to play mm -hmm. the game. I love that. I mean, and that can, and that beach ball being a metaphor for anything. potentially anything. Asking for a raise, having your toenails painted, like asking for what you need in bed. The beach ball can be anything. Yeah. Maybe, I wonder if the painting toenails is even like its own beach ball like, well, why, why that? Because maybe there's something else that, that, right. that's not going on. So again, it's like a symptom to maybe something right. and it's just. And I always sought to support that uh -huh. as, as a stripper. I always sought to support that because I, I can really empathize with feeling like you have to hide something about yourself mm -hmm. because that's where I, I, that, that's that, because that's my story right? Like, let me collect terminal degrees so that, so that I can, so that I can forget that, like, I'm this, like, broke kid from a poor family. Like, yeah. Exactly what it's like to feel like you cannot divulge something about yourself or else someone won't like you. That's shame. So, and curious for you, like, and that was, you know, you had mentioned that earlier when you were getting those degrees and you're like, I am this poor kid from this region and that being your mindset and maybe your outlook on life and expectations on life at what point did you shift from from maybe having that kind of like hidden 
to where you're at now, where you're very express and open and honest, is it something that you're still, that you still kind of grapple with? Or was there like a moment or series of moments or, or experiences that kind of shifted you from, oh, I'm, I'm poor, therefore this, therefore I need to compensate, you know, to becoming like, that's what it is, but I'm a different person now. That's where I came from, but that's not who, who I am now, maybe. That's such, actually, I've never been asked that question. Let me think. So, okay, I'll lead in by saying that I have seen a therapist, the same therapist consistently for 12 years. And I think everybody, everybody should do that. And some people, I, some people think that pole dancing is their therapy. I wholly disagree with that. It is not. It can maybe feel like it, uh-huh. right? It can feel like it, but it isn't. It might be an accessory too, but it's not. So, so I, so I've seen a therapist for 12 years just to work. Everybody's got shit, right? That switch, when did, I know, I do know when that happened. There's always a moment, right? In the narrative. And so, so I think it was on that first tour. So I have worked in universities. Like I, like I use that to try to delete my own history and who I was and all of this stuff. And then I worked in, in, in other people's pole dance studios for years thinking, oh, I could never do that because I thought that having money, businesses, being an entrepreneur or the sort of driver of your own life was for people that weren't like me, right? So I was, it was very like, it was very much like a victim mentality. And I think I was breaking away from that when you and I met, which was 2016 or 2017 uh-huh. at, at Joe's restaurant. Yeah. Do you remember that? Cause I was like, I tell me about popsicles. <laughs> you remember that? I do. I do. Yeah, that that was we had a great conversation. And for context, I was I had a popsicle business at the time called King of Pop. So that's why we were talking about popsicles yes. and a lot of so other stuff too. <laughs> I was contending with this at that time and and uh, I had never had an example ever in my life. I had never ever ever had an example of transformation because in in poverty that's rare. It's very rare that someone transforms a uh, class or transcends, transforms, whatever class. And I think what, what happened was I had, you know, this path in academia, which was a cover up for who I really was, quote unquote, then needed money so bad that this tour thing, this tour idea started and, and the kind of inkling, the kind of switch that started to happen was, was when they kept selling. And, and then I wouldn't just be cold contacting and reaching out to people. They would reach out to me and they would be like, I heard that you were at this studio. Can you come to ours? And, and I was thinking to myself in this part, I was like, wait a minute, there is, they like me and like, 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 and that this thing that I have to say, which was locked under like lock and key for years, this truth that I hold, it, it turns out people want to hear that. It turns out like people want to hear it. And I taught pole dance for seven years. And I think I talked, talk more than I teach. Right. And people were just lining up to listen to me talk. And I thought, well, if they're lining up to listen to me talk, they must think I have good ideas. So what if, what if, what if I make the idea bigger and, 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 So it was just through this constant, it was through constant little by little affirmations, which is what we do in our studio. We call it a confidence or I'm sorry, we call it a compliment train where like, like choo-choo, you know, we're like little, little tight. There was no light that turned on. It was like, oh, hey, tell her that story you told me about that one, you know, blah, 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 or whatever that, that affirmed that I had a talent in not only creating ideas, but also making connections to like time, space, and history and current. Like I'm really good at analogies and metaphors, right? These little tiny things, which is what we do in the studio, compliment this person. And, and the, the person just has to receive it. The, the dancer, ha- just they just have to receive compliment and not say anything in return. You can't be like, oh, well, like, I know you like my front hook spin, but I had actually fucked it up and blah, blah, blah. No. Which is so common for people to do, they right? Minimize. Ta- you know, ta- yeah, minimize. Like you, someone says something good for you, and instead of receiving it, you're talking about how you messed up that 
probably no one no even one noticed. Right. Just so, accept it. Just say, and it's simple, but accept, I mean, just accept the compliment. Just like accept that people are nice to you and yeah. then confirm you. And so, so I was getting these little bites, you know, and, and like tour and I was like, maybe I can do this. Maybe I can do this, which lined up perfectly with getting fired from the last pole studio that I worked in, you know, because what happened was, and by the way, I deserve that. <laughs> You know, like if, if I don't, I don't know what that studio owner is doing now. I don't know. I don't know what she's doing. If she listens to this, like that move she made in firing me was exactly the right move as a business owner. Uh, okay. <laughs> she did exactly the right thing. And, and I deserved it because what was happening was in this lesson was these like, like, you know, I was going on tour, but I was working for a studio at the time. So I was kind of developing and building my own brand Yeah. while working for someone else, which was, it was so pure in my heart. Cause I was like, Oh, if I have my own brand, more people will come to her. Right. Because, because, because I could never own a business, Paul, I could never own a business. I could never do that. That's for not, that's not for people like me. Right. And, and it, and it clashed because my vision didn't align with hers. I run my mouth. Okay. I res- again, <laughs> I resonate with that fully. I run my mouth. <laughs> and when you run your mouth, you get fired. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's, like that's, I was totally disrespectful. So, so I was like, well, fuck now I have no job and, and, but I've got this tour. So like, let me just open a studio because that's the only logical next step. I mean, it, it really is. It's like you went on tour. I mean, it, I don't, I'm, I'm going to finish this thought because I started, but I kind of I wanted to turn yeah. dorky. But, you know, you validated your product. You validated your offer and service by going on tour. Like, I mean, honestly, like the past hour has been like a master class in marketing and sales, 100%. And also in how to like focus on that core mission of let's recap it unique possibility and uniqueness possibility and growth uniqueness possibility and growth like that's what you're selling you're not selling because so, where, so, where most people will, will go to is like oh you're gonna get you know the the south beach body you're gonna get six pack abs like eh, whatever what most people would rather have is to be unique have possibility and and growth okay. i think and that's what most people end up selling is a transformation. So instead of the transformation of, you know, maybe you're a little chubby like I am, then you can get to a six pack ab. Oh, that'd be cool. I'm thinking, no, you're going to train. That's a transformation, but here's a transformation to, you're going to feel like you got six pack abs where you got them or not. And that's far more right. enticing. Right. Um, and, and what I've noticed about feeling like you have six pack abs, even if you don't, if that's your goal, like if you feel like it, like when you do that mindset work, you, then you, if the six pack is what you want, you can get it. Yeah. And I, and I, w- I will say this, and there's one more thing, like I want to definitely touch on as we, as we were wrapping up what you're like going back to like the dance aspect, like, you know, for me, like, you know, go to a lot of Greek dances. I'm Greek. Greek dancing is phenomenal. And just as I've been in there and seen that, like, and not, and not just Greek dance, but any type of dance, you can tell, who is thinking about doing something versus just expressing themselves freely. And, you know, when I'm watching someone dance, I'm not thinking like, Oh, they're, they're a technical dancer. Like right. well, what a great dancer they are. I mean, I have no background or technical knowledge of dancing anyway, but when I'm like, that, Oh man, I like that person, how they dance, what stands out and what I subconsciously am looking at is they are expressing themselves freely yeah. And not to say it's wrong where, you know, some people are tense and tight, which they are. Because the fact that you're out there dancing is, right. that's a win. None of it's then, wrong. Yeah, there's a lot of people who aren't like, quote, good dancers, but they are phenomenal because of how freely they express. And that, and it's like, and that's why it's such a great platform for getting there. I find that just such a fascinating thing. And I love it. The, the the thing I think would be cool to wrap on, you know, and I've got, I've got another 10, 15 minutes. Um, okay. I got all the time in the world. I would love to hear, because you, you talked about a story from the club. If you have a, one or two stories even of 
butter and fill of clients who have like had that transformation where you're like, you epitomize what I'm trying to do with uh, uniqueness, possibility and growth. And maybe, maybe it's like knowing kind of how, where they start and how they've ended up anything like that. I'm so fascinated to like okay. hear like a, basically a client success story. <laughs> okay. A client success story. Okay. So, so let me start about client success and, and affirm or recap what, what I knew is knowledge in my body in the club that my business coach later confirmed, which is that not all money is good money. Right. So, so the people who walk in the door have to be ready right in the club like they have to they have to know you know what even if they don't know what they want they have to know what they're getting right same as the strip club you know I will never be a blonde so a lot of people you, you like I, I like I'm gonna make somebody unhappy if they <laughs> so if they pick me so like and, and I'm not blonde so not all money is good money and the people who walk in the door have to know not only what they're getting but they have to know that that it, it's going to take time to get it and that they may not ever achieve it. Right. And that it's because it's a practice. So that's, so I'm going to lead in with that. So the person who walks in the door, my ideal client has to, I'm not necessarily saying has to be comfortable with um, the unknown, but they have to, they have to be willing to dip their toes in it. Right. Because I don't have a, like a hard deliverable, you know, on my business. Mm -hmm. So, okay, let me think. Client success story. God, there's so many. And maybe I can prompt you too. I mean, I know you've gotten, you know, you're, you're talking like, you get like alpha females in, like, like women who are maybe, you know, or like president, CEOs, vice president, whatever. Yeah. They're like you. higher up. I mean, that could be one. Um, uh, and I get the opposite too. Like I get the shy. Okay. All right. And, and maybe even someone who's like, you know what, Nia, like when I first came in, like I was super shy and nervous, but guess what happened last night? I asked my partner for something totally new. I have. Yes. So, all right. So I had this one client. And, and this is maybe not, this, this is like a, it's a, it's a nebulous and loose success. Okay. But so she came in and bought, she has my highest membership and I do a lot of verbal prompting in class. I'm like, well, how does that prompt, you know, I said, we're going to do this. How does that make you feel? And they're like, yeah, I want to, I want to explore that part of myself. We're like, no, like I don't. So this one woman I was like, hi, hey, how does that make you feel? You know, every day in class. And she would be like, I don't feel. She was like, I don't come here for that. Huh. And I was like, oh, you don't come here to feel. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm like, you in the wrong place. So <laughs> like, you know, people don't, like, don't come to Butter and Felt to turn off. You come to Butter and Felt to turn on. Uh. <laughs> and so she, she would say, I don't think, I don't think, I don't think. Like, and she was like, nope, nope. And, and she was like, my head or my body, the only function of my body is to carry around my head, which thinks. And I was like, whoa, you're my mission. Okay, so so we're in class like, like this one day and it was a topless optional class. I remember this because I do those occasionally. Like, like now that I have a brick and mortar studio and we were on tour, everything was nudity optional. But now to just to keep everything safe and brave we I, I let people know like this class will be topless optional and she came in this this woman who was like no I don't I don't ask me what I think don't ask me if I want to do that I'm, I just want to do it right and I'd asked her one day I was like have you ever like do you do you like experience pleasure like I'm not just talking about sexual pleasure like do you experience that like you know when you bend over to touch your toes it just feels good in your leg to stretch and she said, she was like, no, I don't, it doesn't feel good. Like, I don't feel anything anyway. So fast forward, we're in this like top of this class. The lights are low. I took down my security cameras, right? Because I was like, nothing is going to be recorded here. And I don't know what happened, but there was something about the like physical nudity right? Like, like, like literally and removing like of the, like that moment of like removing. And it was almost like demonic possession. This woman snapped 
And like, I, like, I don't know what the fuck happened. Like I can't explain it. And what I saw, and again, this is, this is nebulous. It's not like, Oh, I asked for the raise and I got it. Yeah. Like, I saw this woman. She didn't even touch the motherfucking pole. She was like rolling around on the ground, like an almost like speaking in tongues, churchy, like kind of thing naked in like nothing but a thong and like crying and I was like and I thought and I was like oh what do I do like have I have I just triggered someone you know like have yeah. I just like, brought back to me? and and so the song you know like the song ends and you got to hold space and all this stuff and and like so I faded out the music and I was like what what's going on like what like what do you need you know, because I'm like, is this a trigger? Did I just trigger some trauma or is this like a breakthrough? And, and she was like, she was like, I, I have, I have never connected to my body in my life until right now. That is like, it's again, it's not like, it's not a marketable, sellable success story. This isn't like, I, asked my partner to like lick my pussy to the left a little bit more sorry if you can't put that in there but like <laughs> like you know it's not like like the sort of like marked defined success like this person in through the act of like like the having a space that's brave that that you can release in did so was brave and released wow Th and that's that's not something that you can't put that on your resume. You can't, you, you, that's impossible to go have coffee with your friends and be like, Hey, I, I connected with my body. Like no, people are like, what? Like, like, so yeah. like you connected with your body. Like don't. And so like if that, it was, it was wonderful. And well, I don't know what happened. But what, what was, and, and what was like kind of her demeanor body language, like maybe the rest of the class or even the next time you saw her I mean was it did did she kind of carry that her shoulders went from like an like an inward rotation like a like an internally rotated shoulder to like a neutral like she her physical like her spine changed visually like and it was like it was doing that like like when she was dancing too like I like I don't know if that's too heady for this but no yeah like that's perfect like, I mean that's I, I can, I mean, just, I think we can all like know like different body languages. Like, like her like, actual chin lifted. Uh-huh. And, and ever since then, like when, when she comes to class, like, like, it, like you break, just break through. Like you can see she, she just like operates in a different way. And I was like, my work here is done. That's incredible. My I work, mean, I don't know what that moment birthed. I mean, only, I think only only she will know. But but what yeah. you do know is that, well, and maybe you've asked her, like, you know, you, you said your body is just for your head to think. You don't feel like, are you feeling things more? How yeah, I know. And I want to catch up with her on that. That was like, we did that right before we closed for the holidays. So this, like, I, like, I want to like, I want to check in with that. And, and yeah, it was, man, it was incredible. Yeah. That's awesome. God, that's, I mean, because again, that's like, I mean, you're seeing it happen and to, and to your point, like, yeah, it's not, you, you don't get to see when they're like, oh, I, I asked for the raise and I asked for this in bed. Right. You're seeing that moment and it's just, yeah, it's maybe it was accumulation of everything all at once. You, you know, I imagine that wasn't her first class because you nope. are, she yeah. For a year. Okay. Yeah. And she's just like, and I, yeah. And that's amazing because I didn't sell that, right? Like what I sold was the space. I sold the time and the space for her to choose to do that work herself. Yeah. You, you, you allowed her to do it. You gave her the space. It's a vehicle to do it. She had it. And this is, I guess, for anyone, she has to get in that car and drive it, or she has yes. to open that door. You're like, here we are. You got to you got to go in now. And... You got one hour to do, you know, something to do something. Yeah. And that's, and, and I love that I can sell that and, and it, and, and do well and make money for, for myself, which enables me to do even more of yeah. that type of service. So that's so incredible, but 
Damn. I mean, we should, I mean, as always, we could, we could do this again, have a second part episode. I would love up. that. I think that's the wrap for today. I feel like once I just accepted the darkness of my own history, I was able to alchemize that into light and passion and yeah.